I'm Christy. Welcome to An Atheist Asks, and in today's episode, I'm going to be looking at scientific prediction and biblical prophecies. In today's video, I'm going to separate it into two sections. In the first section, I'm going to review some of the qualities of predictions in science and then look at three examples of scientific predictions. And then in the second part of the video, I'm going to explore what I've found about biblical prophecy because I'm not an expert, but I've done a little bit of looking around and trying to find some stuff. And I'm going to share with you what I've found on biblical prophecy, give an assessment of it, and then show three examples of biblical prophecy. So that's basically what this episode is going to be about, and if that sounds interesting, then let's get started. To set up the scientific part of it, I just want to speak a little bit about why I'm putting prophecy and prediction together. And that's because in theory, a prophecy and a prediction are both meant to tell you something about a future event or a future, future observation. And it then therefore makes sense that we would compare the ways in which science gets to its predictions and the way that the Bible has developed or assigned its prophecy. Prediction is really important in science, and that's because it's through prediction that we figure out which theories are worth keeping. Um, prediction is the way that we cull bad ideas from science. And the idea here, like with, let's say, go back and, and have an idea like phrenology. Someone might have an idea that bumps on your head are related to the structures of your brain, but if over several attempts to verify this, you keep coming up that it doesn't provide us with more or new information about the world that we didn't have before or that we can't trust it, you check it out. So science is pretty ruthless when it comes to its predictions um, and theories will stand or fall based on whether or not they're able to make accurate predictions. Prophecy is also very important to Christians. If you look at people's testimonies in terms of why they became a Christian or other Christian websites, you see a lot of emphasis put on prophecy. So. Given that, I thought it would be interesting to compare the two approaches and put them in contrast uh, for people who might not be familiar with one or the other or both. To start the science section, and that's what we're moving into now, is the review of predictions and three examples, what I want to do is provide a standard of what I'm going to use in terms of what a theory is when we make these kinds of predictions. Now this definition, I think, is it goes down to my PhD supervisor. So you won't find this in a dictionary, but it does have a, a lot of elements that are important for the scientific method. So um, the definition goes like this. In the sciences, and that includes the social sciences, a theory is a logical explanation of a manner of interaction of a set of phenomena. It may contain a testable model of the manner of interaction of that phenomena, be capable of predicting future occurrences, and or be capable of being tested or otherwise falsified through empirical observation. So that's the criteria that we have as scientists when we want to make a prediction. We have to make a prediction that deals with some of these points and, have, and meet the standards as laid out here. And so to see how science does that, let's look at three examples of predictions made by scientists. As I move through these three scientific examples, you can pay attention to these points. How is the prediction constructed? What informs the prediction? Is it precise in its nature? Does it make a very, very narrow, very specified, risky prediction in terms of what it's, the theory says? Is it framed in such a way that it can be shown to be wrong? Can we get a re result that allows us to reject the theory? This is vital in science. And can it be independently verified? It's absolutely fantastic if I can make something happen in, in my lab or run my data set as a social scientist, but if nobody else can replicate my results, that's a bit of a problem. And so those are the things that um, I'm going to be picking out, pulling out, and highlighting in terms of people's scientific predictions. And the three examples I've chosen, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to link in the D box, the description box below, a bunch of videos uh, on each of these topics. So you can peruse those at your leisure. But the three scientific predictions that I want to present to you is Einstein's prediction on the effect of gravity on light. I want to look at Mendeleev and the periodic table of elements, and I want to look at the existence of a Higgs boson. Now, you guys remember I'm a social scientist, okay? So I've checked this and I've, I've done some research, you know, I've done the research, I've made notes, I think I've gotten everything correct. But if I make any mistakes, always defer to the experts that I'll link in the D box below, and that way you won't ever have to worry about citing me. <laughs> 
<laughs> and end up being wrong because I was wrong. Like I said, I do, I did check this, but always uh, go to the videos for, for a better, fuller, more academic explanation. Starting with Einstein. Einstein's general theory of relativity it has an implication, and that is that um, mass or gravity can bend light or electromagnetic fields. And we have a problem here on Earth. The Earth is not big enough for us to detect that um, the amount of gravity needed to pull light. So even though there was the theory of the general theory of relativity and there was this proposal, it was just an idea initially. Einstein's proposal was just an idea. So in 1919, Arthur Eddington, who was an astrophysicist, led an expedition to view a solar eclipse. And the way that they constructed their experiment was to um, take a picture of a star in the night sky um, and then the next, and position that star in such a way that when the eclipse happened, it would be you would be able to see the sun, uh, I'm sorry, you would be able to see the star uh, behind the sun. So you couldn't obviously measure light that wasn't near the sun. You had to have a star that was light that was coming from past our sun to us in order to observe this effect. So they first went and when there was no sun between us, took a picture, uh, waited for the full eclipse, took another picture, and what they noticed was, I think the difference is barely one arc second, but enough to confirm the general theory of relativity and it made Einstein famous. So that's uh, an example of a very, very precise prediction, a precise effect. They went out, they knew exactly what to look for, they tested it, there was every possibility that Einstein could have been wrong, but he wasn't. In this case, his prediction was correct, and we can then visually confirm that finding and move on. It now becomes a piece of knowledge that we can rest other pieces of prediction on. And the more times we observe this, obviously, the more confidence we have, and, and now people don't even kind of question this idea. The next scientist I want to talk about is Dmitry Mendeleev. First, I'm going to have a cup of a little thing of tea. Mendeleev is probably not a name you're familiar with, but he was the guy who established the periodic table of elements as we know it today. Now in Mendeleev's day, there were a lot of different ways, a lot of people had organized the periodic table. There were many competing ideas about how to do it. But Mendeleev's brilliance came from his seeing what wasn't there. He saw the gaps in the table. And so instead of just pushing all the information together, he left those gaps. And he started to work out a system whereby, based on um, a missing element uh, where it turns up in the table, he would predict its properties. And I'm going to give a specific example with um, an element he predicted called, he called Eka Aluminum. And so what he, uh, there was a, a place in the chart, I can't remember the atomic weight, but it's in the video. Um, he predicted its atomic weight, how solid, the solidity of it, its melting point, and the physical weight in grams. All based on what he knew about other elements and what that told him about the piece of missing information in his, his table. And a few years later, a new element was discovered. It was called um, gallium. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And basically, Mendeleev got all the physical properties right. I mean, there was a bit of a margin of error, but considering he was inferring from an empty space in a chart with based on other inferences from his knowledge of chemistry, that's really amazing. He also predicted several other elements that were unknown at the time, and he was right. Uh, some 70 years after his table and his predictions, he was still getting, um, they were still finding elements that he had predicted. That to me is amazing, that, um, that his knowledge and understanding was so precise. He was willing to make predictions that would not be confirmed until 70 years later. That's pretty impressive. So that's, um, that's Mendeleev and the periodic table of elements. The final thing I want to briefly review in terms of the impressiveness of scientific prediction has to do with Higgs boson. Now again, not a natural scientist, but um, from my understanding, they were theorized since the 1960s. And this particle was inferred from observation, but it had not yet been directly observed. We had to build human beings, I guess, as you know, humanity, we had to build a special machine in order to create the conditions to, to create um, something like a Higgs boson. And that's what we did. We spent millions and millions and millions to do that. And we found some. Uh, several hundred have been observed. And this 
knowledge now um, about the existence of things like Higgs bosons answers a fundamental question about the way nature works. Um, and these discoveries are really key to advancing our civilization in the way that discovering electricity was, or discovering uh, the atom, or the electron. So um, again, we took a huge risk as, a, as you know, a, a lot of money was spent on the assumption that we could create the conditions that w would allow us to observe this fundamental particle. And we were right. Not we. Obviously me. I didn't do anything. Smarter people did it. But I think as humans we get to claim it because it's our human knowledge that has been producing this. It's led to this and it's taking us this far. So I think that that's, I hope you guys find that really impressive. It blows my mind um, to make a prediction based like uh, on information like that and to turn out to just nail it. Freaking nail it. That's awesome. Um, so that's my discussion of science and now I'm going to talk about biblical prophecy. So I hadn't done too much research into biblical prophecy. I grew up a Catholic and that wasn't something that was huge in our church. And even when I went to look on the internet, there was um, most of the emphasis that I found was on end times prophecy, not on Jesus, um, prophesizing Jesus. And obviously because end times aren't something we can observe, that makes no sense for me to compare scientific prediction with end times prophecies. So we'll have to narrow the body of work to prophecies about events that should have already been in the past. In other words, we can, we have to be beyond the, the prophecy in order to evaluate it. And that's, so I'm only going to be dealing with prophecies that deal with Jesus um, and not the end times for precisely that reason. As I said, I didn't know that much about prophecy. And so once I decided, you know, obviously I can't do end times, I'm going to focus on the Jesus prophecies. Then it really fell apart um, pretty quickly in terms of research because being a nerd and a geek, I thought that there would be really systematic processes that people had gone through to look at the prophecies. For instance, you know, would you, I would assume, I, if I were going to be doing this, not that I would, but like if I, now, you know, if I was going to do this, I would want to see all of the prophecies in their various languages. If we have it in, in ancient Hebrew, get it in ancient Hebrew. If we have it in Greek, um, you know, then have it in that way. And look at the language and look at the, the differences in the translations and also look at the English and try to in, explain to people how you got to know which prophecy, you know, which version of it you wanted to pull out. I didn't find anything like that. Um, doesn't seem to be a whole lot of linguistic analysis of prophecies, but then again, maybe I just didn't, you know, spend a year and a half looking. I, I spent about three weeks looking, which seemed to me a pretty a, a large amount of time to do it. Um, I also thought they would have some sort of ranking of how well the prophecies performed. For instance, is a prophecy fulfilled in four gospels, or in three gospels, or only in two gospels, or just in one gospel? And it doesn't seem to work like that. It just seems like if you have a line, you get a tick. And that to me also lacks rigor, lacks any kind of systematic thought. I would also have thought based on things like a linguistic analysis and the sort of charts that in terms of which prophecies are, you know, have the most observations, there would be some kind of ranking, some sort of like, the way that they have like with uh, Paul's letters, for instance, their scholars are basically agreed on a certain set of letters that they say these are authentic, and then they go these are the disputed letters, and they are like, these are the ones we have problems with. And I thought perhaps there would be some honesty there that there were some prophecies that were stronger than others, and some prophecies that were yeah, you kind of got to read it this way. Um, but no, it just seemed like there was no evidence of any kind of systematic approach, any kind of sound approach, what they do instead, from my experience, is that you get um, a long list of prophecies that have been purported to be fulfilled. And they just throw you, throw 300 lines of bi Bible quotes saying Jesus fulfilled all of these. And that of course requires, well, you to do one of two things. Take what they say, um, whether or not, you know, if it's true or not. And I have to say, I've had friends, I've had enough friends, but I've had people on debate boards throw these lists at me. And when I actually click on them to check the claim, sometimes it's completely wrong. And I'll call them on it, and then they don't have enough response. But, um, yeah, there's this the, a tendency to overwhelm you by just throwing a whole bunch of lines of text at you saying that Jesus fulfilled them, or throwing just, you know, Genesis 
what whatever you know at you just just those sort of passages numbers and then they also really abuse probability really 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 abuse probability by taking each individual claim and saying what is the probability of someone doing this and this and this and so you end up multiplying up all of the individual ones and they make up they claim that they can figure out what the op odds of being born in Bethlehem in uh, the sort of you know the early first century was I don't and they don't ever demonstrate this they never show you how they get the numbers of, of how they estimate these probabilities and yet, so they'll take each of those, they'll make up numbers from what I can see. They'll make up numbers about the likelihood of an event and then they'll multiply it by all, by all the other likelihoods of all the other separate prophe prophecies being fulfilled and saying, oh, there's like a one in 18 billion, trillion, gazillion, jillion chances that any one person could have done it and Jesus did it. Okay, if you don't know math, you might be really impressed by that. Um, but there's really no attempt that I've seen in terms of the YouTube videos I've looked at or other website, you know, sort of uh, doing a research through Google, that there is any systematic attempt to justify or provide evidence or provide clarity for these things. So I'm kind of going to break this down into three categories of problems that I have with biblical prophecies. And that is, one, mistranslations. There doesn't seem to be any standard or quality control for language. There doesn't seem to be an awareness of differences in, in versions of the text. And so this ends up leading to unreliable prophecies. Another category I'm going to include in the, my examples of the three prophecies I'm going to look at is uh, false prophecies, where they just get it wrong. Uh, or they claim that the prophecy said something, and there's no prophecy that says that. That is also, I think, a, another area where Bible prophecy has to address some of its deficiencies. And the third category I see is prophecy historicized. I'm pretty sure I'm stealing this from John Dominican Crossan, but the, the idea is that if the Messiah was meant to do something, like ride on a colt, so there's a passage in Matthew where he talks about when the person will enter the city and he will be riding on a colt and an ass. It's a form of poetry. It's not meant to... I, get the idea that Jesus is animal surfing, you know, like on two animals. Uh, but Matthew, the author of Matthew, obviously didn't understand this. He, it, uh, he read it literally and put Jesus on two animals. And so the problem with this is anybody could do that. You're prophesizing really mundane things. I don't think being born in a city is that exceptional because it happens all the time. I don't think riding on a colt and an ass, if anyone can do it, then it's not prophecy. So um, I'm going to basically show the problems I see in, in biblical prophecy because of these three problems. And maybe Christians will take this up and start to do this kind of work or point me into the direction of this kind of work, break down some of this probability numbers, um, and basically I, I do a response video. Um, I would like to see, you know, really what is underneath this because in terms of my initial investigations, I'm not very impressed. The first biblical prophecy I want to take up is Genesis 3.15. The two problems with this is one, mistranslation, and two, it's prophecy historicized. So the passage itself reads in the New International Version, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, the problem that is in this text is that, according to Jeff um, from the Mechanical Torah translation, I'll put a link in the description box to his videos on this mistranslation, but he claims that current modern translators are ignoring the grammar of the ancient Hebrew, and they have mistranslated it. When he translates this passage, it comes up as um, and again, this is using uh, without abstract language, this is a c concrete description. And I set down hostility between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will fall upon you a head, and you will fall upon him a heel. There are two possible translations that he offers in this video for understanding what this passage means. The first is, he will strike you with a head, and you will strike him with a heel. In other words, the snake will strike you with his head, and you will strike him with your heel. Another one is, the way that it's phrased in, in the ancient Hebrew can also, a head can also mean um, first. So another, a second meaning of this will, could be, ye, uh, he will strike you first, 
and you will strike him last. So let's just put that back into the initial to see what this line reads. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike you first and you will strike him last. Nothing to do with the devil, nothing to do with Satan. Um, unless Jesus went around killing snakes, um, I don't really see how this could possibly be a prophecy. And what this is, is obviously a retro reading. There's nothing in here that's predictive. Um, the only thing it says is that snakes are going to bite people and people are going to kill snakes. And if you're familiar with Exodus, you know that, you know, like the snake um, staff and um, is, is something that comes up again. So snakes were really deadly in the ancient world. Uh, people freaked out about them and I, I can understand that because I'm afraid of dark too and snakes and lots of things that can kill you. So the idea that this is somehow a prophecy when it's basically saying there's going to be enmity between humans and snakes, I just don't see it. I just don't see any evidence for it. The next one I'm going to take up is Matthew 2.23. And the next passage, actually the third example, is also Matthew. I, the smash, I like to smash Matthew. Um, mostly because he makes a lot of lies up. <laughs> and more so than, you know, quite a lot of the other authors. And um, he also just, like, is not really good... He doesn't know his Bible. Uh, the author of Matthew obviously had the Greek translation, uh, the Septuagint, and was going from that and had no clue as to what the ancient Hebrew was. So that, to me, is quite, you know, brings some alarm bells in terms of making prophecies. But I'm going to um, read a prophecy and then I'm going to tell you the problem that I have with it. So from Matthew 2.23. And he came and dwelled in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. The problem with this prophecy is that it's false. There are no prophecies spoken by any prophets, let alone multiple prophets, saying that the Messiah will be called a Nazarene. Um, it's, the Gospel of Matthew explains that the title comes from the prophecy, he will be called a Nazarene, but this has no obvious Old Testament source. So you can't really fulfill a prophecy that doesn't exist. And I do think Christians need to kind of weed out these kinds of obvious problems if they're going to want to sell biblical prophecy as a basis for becoming a Christian. Okay, so the final Bible example that I want to give is from Matthew 21, 3. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. This again is where the poetry comes in. The, the king who was coming in was meek and therefore sitting upon an ass. And then it's repetition, a colt, the foal of an ass. But Matthew, the author of Matthew, made the mistake of thinking sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. And this um, verse in, in Zechariah 9.9 9 can't even be applied to Jesus because the person being referred to in Zechariah was both a military leader and the king of an earthly kingdom, neither of which um, Jesus did in his lifetime. So what we have here is um, an attempt to create a prophecy historicized. Matthew creates a scenario in which Jesus goes out to do his thing and his followers bring him a cult and an ass so that the prophecy might be fulfilled. I don't think, again, you get to, um, you know, make up prophecies uh, and, and accomplish them when anybody can do them. I don't really think that that's a criteria for fulfillment. Maybe the criteria for prophecy fulfillment is another thing Christians would want to think about in terms of operationalizing it in order to better evaluate their biblical prophecies. So, what am I really getting at? Basically, there's a difference here between the way that science makes its predictions and the Bible has created its prophecies. Science has a system for producing predictions that are precise, allow for a yes or no answer, it connects on knowledge we already have, it builds us new knowledge, and it can be independently verified. Biblical prophecy, on the other hand, appears to have no rigor from my efforts to investigate it and analyze it. The predictions are either based on a questionable translation, based on prophecies that never existed, or the writer got them wrong, or they're so mundane and vague that anybody could accomplish them. Biblical prophecies do not provide a clear answer. They don't contribute in any meaningful way to human understanding, and they haven't advanced our knowledge at all. So what it comes down to is, I guess, science. It works, bitches. <laughs> so, this has been an Atheist Asks. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for watching.